good uh, evening. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to Professor Esal Valente, to my host, Professor Gritti, and to the organization of the workshop. It's really an honor to be here and to share with all of you uh, some of uh, the things I work about, uh, I work on, and um, my perspective and my um, experiences. The project I'm presenting tonight, I've presented several times in several places, and I realized today, or a few days ago, that maybe this is the first time I presented again in one same place. My apologies to those of you who already saw the presentation or the exhibition that took place here um, two years ago, I think. I hope that the update that I will add to it, that I've added to it, makes sense to you too. But I found it impossible to break from, from its um, original, let's say, uh, fundamentals and from the, uh, to explain the argument and the ideas that are behind the work of these, um, sorry me, of these um, um, collective work around the idea of reclaiming heritage, uh, in, in particular materials, uh, heritage materials. Um, I will, as I say, it's hard to depart from your uh, origins. And this is my origin. I come originally from Chile, this crazy land at the edge of the Pacific in South America. Crazy in many ways. And maybe the craziest of them all is that we were this close to beating Brazil this, t this year, but we do have a world record, and that is on earthquakes. Uh, it's not clear, but it's clear uh, enough that it was above 9 degrees Richter, the earthquake of 1960, that uh, hit the charts and made it to be the biggest ever registered. In 2010, we had another top five uh, in uh, the south of Chile, in Concepcion also, um, south, uh, southern uh, city just as Valdivia is, uh, that made it 8.8. Uh, .8. For you who are also an um, earthquake-prone country, uh, more or less um, know that the magnitude of these events is really beyond imagination and uh, you can only live uh, to understand and to tell what it is like. So I trust your ex own experiences uh, help you to follow this argument. What this means in, in, in the particular case of Chile, and this is where we departed from, is that uh, the earthquakes, uh, well, obviously destroy architecture. And that's, I think, an interesting um, problem, a different challenge. In particular, uh, in a relatively poor country still, like Chile is, what happens is that we have very little uh, infrastructure, very little money to protect a heritage uh, architecture. And um, above all, this uh, heritage architecture that is not a monumental one, but that is a more humble um, heritage. So what happens to little villages as this one, San Lorenzo in, in Tarapacá, in the desert north of Chile, uh, with the earthquake of 2005, that is more or less a routine earthquake for our uh, country, for our standards, is this. So believe it or not, these are the same street before and after the earthquake. Mm? And the whole city, the whole village, here you see in a before and after comparison. Um, this is, of course, a very uh, regrettable loss. Our country deals very um, problematically with these, or rather doesn't deal with this um, phenomena at all, and has very little resources to cope with this loss. So that was our first challenge, our first contention in this project, and that, I, as I said, uh, we, we um, addressed from a distance from Berlin with a group of um, European, basically European students um, under my supervision uh, that eventually evolved into what I will show you in a second. Uh, so the, the Chilean capacity of coping with the emergencies is this, which is a quite respectable system of producing emergen emergency shelter known uh, um, as mediaguas. Mediaguas are these um, three by three huts that are produced in a big factory and that are delivered for whenever anything happens. The problem, as you might imagine, is that eventually 
they become um, definite. So they stay there for a long time. Mm? And that is, of course, not good for the heritage or, or for the quality of the urban space that you saw uh, being lost in the previous slides. Uh, the kind of thing that we managed to build looks like this, which is a um, um, factory-made brick reinforced masonry that uh, has a number of uh, environmental problems in that climate that you can see in the back, which is an absolute desert, that is centrally designed in Santiago, which is the capital where everything goes, uh, but unfortunately, uh, doesn't fit at all to this context, doesn't fit at all, has no response for the heritage qualities that we re could recognize, if you agree with me in the previous slides, and uh, the worst, don't even uh, cope with the earthquakes, as you can see here too. So they do basically little more than nothing. Hmm? Of course, people are very happy with these things. Is this, this is what everyone wants. I lived in a house like this when I was a kid, and I couldn't complain, but of course, uh, in terms of architectural, um, let's say, uh, development and cultural uh, persistence of a certain set of values and, um, and interests, it's very problematic. So, um, coming to the uh, earthquake of 2010, as I tell you, um, I think it's important not to forget that this is a catastrophe that goes well beyond the material loss and has a big um, impact in the life of many. Sometimes I regret showing these slides because they are a bit sort of, um, um, let's say, uh, could be disturbing for someone. And, but I think at the same time it's important not to lose measure that uh, a number, thousands of people die sometime sometimes in these events, not in Chile, because fortunately we have a very strong engineering culture that uh, helps us uh, to cope with this in a very acceptable uh, way. And nevertheless, the losses uh, do not only, uh, are not only limited to the architectural interests, let's say, but involve the society as a whole. Uh, this particular event was catastrophic not because of the earthquake, but because of the tsunami that came afterwards. We know how to cope with the earthquakes because they come, we have major earthquakes every 20 years, um, big earthquakes every five, and earthquakes every day. Uh, this one uh, came with, an, uh, with a tsunami that happens every 80 to 100 years, so we forget. We do not forget about earthquakes, but b we do forget about tsunamis, and we don't know what to do. So people actually die, and uh, uh, many, many avoidable losses uh, happen uh, because we are not really aware of what to do or how to do it. Here you can see the seashore of Iloca, a very commonplace example that was washed away by this big wave that went all the way across uh, the Pacific to Japan, uh, where it didn't do this, of course, uh, but did hit the, the, the shore of Chile, that is a very um, oceanic country, if you will, uh, very harshly. Hmm? Um, our problem was uh, slightly off the coast. Uh, here you can see a little uh, forest, and this village is uh, right behind, protected by this hill and forest uh, uh, from the sea. So fortunately, we didn't cope with this um, a major catastrophe uh, as the tsunami is, but we did cope, uh, or we did uh, have in this case, uh, Chanco is called the village, the problem is with the earthquake that I showed you before. Um, in a cooperation with my former university in Santiago, the Catholic University of Chile, uh, we ended up working here as part of a task force deployed by many universities in the country to help, let's say, basically. Fortunately, as architects, we have a little more specific help to provide, and uh, our um, contribution can be more than just pulling out rubble, but can be a bit more disciplinary. From Berlin, we added our team of European students to come and see what to do in this town. This is Chanko before and after. 
in a heritage protected area in Chile called Zona Típica. And here you can see what the earthquake did to these basically one story high adobe built uh, houses with uh, clay roofs, um, corridors, etc. Uh, a vast destruction. The characteristics of the town, why it was designated typical area or heritage protected, are these, uh, as I say, these materials that have very good environmental properties and belong to a very important tradition of the countryside in, in Chile, and these beautiful corridors protecting them from the sun, from the sun together with the m nice mass of the walls that um, provides inertia for the inside to be fresh in the summer, warm in the winter, etc., etc. A number of uh, qualities that unfortunately uh, were destroyed like this by the earthquake, but not only by the earthquake, but also because of the rush of doing something afterwards. The companies, uh, this is a forest area, the companies uh, brought or lended machinery to the uh, state so that people could demolish and get the rubble away. Uh, this, in a rush of one or two weeks after the evaluation of the firemen that is depicted here, I've been told that in Italy it's exactly the same thing. Uh, Vigilio del Fuoco go and say this yes, this no. I have met the firemen in Italy and I can tell you they are really skilled and well prepared compared to our volunteer uh, firemen. But the logic is the same. The rush, and this is um, a um, bulldozer, let's say, strategy for getting rubble away. It's against this. This, of course, uh, based on a uncertain evaluation might mean that you may demolish something that didn't really need to be demolished. That you could take a little time, think it over, and then do something else. But there is this big media mobilization and uh, show, we could say, where everyone helps, etc., etc., also the universities, uh, that leads and presses uh, for action. And this action is sometimes, of course, mistaken too. Here, uh, a couple of facades. You see, it's nothing so monumental or famous uh, compared to, well, many other heritage uh, areas that you might know. But it's the only thing we have. <laughs> we need to take care of this. Hmm? And unfortunately, our regulation is very conservative in the worst sense. So they're very formalistic and very... Um, um, let's say, um, far from reality, there's no investment on behalf of the state, there's only requirements. So if you own a protected property, you have a big burden and no one pays you a dime to do something about it. So what happens is then that this destruction remains and no alternatives are seen. The alternative we seeked for was, as I said at the beginning, how many minutes do I... Okay. Uh, the, uh, the alternatives we seek for were based on the, um, the documentation of this heritage that we conducted with uh, um, a group of students coming, coming to the places. Here you can see uh, how these facades and buildings and corridors were configured. It was, uh, um, this was all very late, a year or two after the earthquake happened. And that was good because then we didn't have so much pressure since we were coming from Germany, we could do things. This is a view of what one of these corridors is like. This doesn't exist anymore. Even if we went there, documented everything, there's actually very little you can do. The rain washed it away because of the structural damages and this corridor has been lost. Unfortunately, I don't have an image of this, but you can take my word for it. Some awareness does exist, but it's not enough to uh, stop or change the situation. And here, as I told you before, the kind of image that leads the reconstruction based on a very efficient housing provision system that is a model for many other countries, but that um, does very little more than this that, as you can imagine, or as you can see, doesn't have too much to, to do with uh, heritage. Because the system works, it's the only thing we can mobilize to reconstruct. So, this is what we built. Um, 
because we are very practical and efficient people, um, little more than these little houses. So the cycle is then the destruction, the original, let's say, corridor, the destruction, the mediawa, and the reconstruction. That's all you can expect. And we were trying to problematize this and go a bit further by asking ourselves, what if we rescue these materials, pick them up one by one, brick by brick, tile by tile, and build something new out of that? And this is our test uh, that we have uh, pursued in, in the case of Chanko and later in the case of Haiti that I will try to show you if time allows. Uh, that's a, a dump yard where all these adobe houses finished after the bulldozer took them here. Paradoxically, the dump yard is inside the heritage zone, but since it's a dump yard, it's not protected. Hmm? This is what the houses look like when, when they are torn down. Of course, you can do some, let's say, um, um, preventive measures of uh, structural reinforcement, but uh, budgets don't allow in these, um, in these uh, little villages. But we did see the potential of then reusing the materials. When this is one house where the, the owners themselves, or the people, took the tiles down with the expectation of repairing the roof as it previously was. And we thought, well, maybe that way. Hmm? We looked for uh, the materials that were actually stored around. I have also seen this storage in, in L'Aquila, where we visited uh, with Andrea and other colleagues. Um, so it's a standard also pattern of keeping them. What to do with them is, uh, of course, not so clear necessarily, or at least not in our case. As you see, the Mediawas are waiting there, ready to take over. Mm? Um, one model that uh, led us, since we were coming from Berlin, is this one. Uh, these are, after the war, as you know, uh, in Germany, uh, women, who were the bulk of the population, uh, took over and uh, worked in clearing these bricks against food uh, coupons, cleared them to be reused out of the rubble of the destruction after the bombardments. You can see the houses built back there, and that was quite an inspiration for us to see, well, maybe this we could bring to, to Chile as an experience, as a learning from Berlin and contribute to the uh, Chilean situation. Because Chileans are very clever and they have it all solved. They, they, they can uh, they make solutions, but we expect it to contribute something new. This is another nice example, the um, chapel of the reconciliation at the border between East and West Berlin that was uh, and dynamite in the very last uh, years of the separation and eventually rebuilt also, also out of the debris with rammed earth and reusing the foundations of uh, the original chapel. Mm -hmm. we, we tried to develop a bit of a methodology and see if we could bring a toolkit to, to cheap. Um, of course you need to some, somehow support this idea. Is it how possible it is, how reasonable it is, um, how cost-effective, etc. Uh, we found a number of arguments for and against. This is an interesting argument for that we saw in one earthquake in 2005, also in San Lorenzo, I showed you at the beginning, that the one house that didn't fall had this very beautiful mixed system of wooden frames that were like a cage where the adobe uh, bricks, you know, adobe means raw, not fired bricks, uh, were laid inside so that the, uh, the um, bricks themselves could take some of the compression and then the faces of uh, wooden uh, frames could take the traction and then altogether the wall be a bit flexible in order not to fall down. Hmm? Um, this is very true, uh, as, as proven in this case, as I tell you, because this was the only one house that survived. We tried to reprise this idea and developed a little bit of a building system towards this, uh, with several trials and errors as well, 
that I will show you applied in a second. Um, costs is still not uh, our advantage. According to our calculations, it's of course more expensive to take down the, the pieces one by one. This is something we should be aware of, but unfortunately we cannot claim, uh, claim it being more um, uh, cheaper. Hmm? What is, yes, an advantage, as I say, is that the uh, properties of, um, of a massive wall are very good in environmental terms, and in a country like Chile that has in spite of its uh, concentration in the Mediterranean climate in the center, has very extreme climates north and south, and in particular in the north, uh, and well, also in the center area where sun radiation is a very strong component, can be uh, very relevant. Mm -hmm. Yes, 20, thank you. Um, so how we did this um, is by engaging the universities in a, um, let's say, social problem and going there, working with students in the field and trying to make a little contribution. This was, uh, surprisingly, uh, a strong tradition in, in the, uh, Til Berlin, where there's several projects of construction in, in several contexts that uh, supported us uh, quite strongly and encouraged us. In Chile, against that, this is most unusual and it goes against all the administration uh, constraints. It's making it virtually impossible, um, as we saw in, in the previous cases. So here's more or less what we did in the, in the case of Chanco that I was showing you, is that we were given an old house doomed for uh, demolition by the municipality outside the protected area, and we broke it down piece by piece to reconstruct something new. This is a little sample of a design that had a different scope, of course, but that was as much as we could um, afford with the budget we had that was basically zero and that was smuggled from other projects uh, against all administrational constraints again. Mm -hmm. So here you see adobe bricks, doors, panels, uh, uh, tiles, timber beams, etc. valuable uh, pieces of material that in our imagination would embody the, the qualities of this um, heritage and bring it, in spite of a different um, formal repertoire, to be a valid continuation of its uh, predecessors. Here a bit more of the design that uh, tried to be contemporary but at the same time reprise some of the uh, motives of the traditional architecture. So we did it with uh, students. These are Coincidentally, here you see two Italian students, Politecnico and Firenze, and, uh, and a number of, uh, of people working um, with us, mostly student, uh, students at the time. These are, this is the original house that also has a bit of a quality. We were a bit like uh, reluctant, saying, well, maybe we could do something else. But the house was going to be demolished anyway, so we did take it down. It had a number of problems anyways. And the work was very intensive, very... Um, uh, let's say, time-consuming. Oops, this you already saw. And, uh, and uh, led us to construct this little prototype elsewhere. Uh, here you see, and this is, I think, an important point, here you see our mistake. We made the mistake of building a foundation to begin with. After we dig all this out, after we revolved the cement, poured it inside, and finished finally the foundation, we realized we shouldn't have, been in, uh, have built any foundation. We should have reused the foundation because the foundations do not shake the way the buildings, they don't oscillate. They simply follow the ground. So they have a better prospect of uh, uh, survival, let's say. Uh, mistake number one. Um, but we learn from mistakes. That's, that's not bad. Hmm? Nevertheless, in spite of the mistakes, we went on and um, built our samples of what I was telling you. Here you see the cage of, this is a mishmash of structures, etc. I, I know, but it's like a little bit like a prototype uh, where you can see that the argument uh, against the uh, Chilean regulations what the, was that this is a um, timber construction rather than adobe one. I will speed up because otherwise I won't come to anything new. Here you see the um, 
the development of the of the house, the reuse of the combination of timber and adobe in a different way, the little ants working there. They, we enjoyed a lot working. Huh? It's really hard work, but joyful work. And here's something more or less what it ended up being with reuse of uh, the tiles, reuse of the windows. Some pieces, of course, are new, no way around that. But we were trying to, in particular, um, recover the roofing and the mass of the walls. Hmm? Um, how many minutes do I have left? 15, OK. Um, so as I told you, we learned from our mistakes. And um, we tried to take this further to a different context and see if it worked elsewhere. And because the students don't measure the uh, problems, they told me, why don't we go to Haiti? And I said, oof, OK. And we went to Haiti and tried to do the same thing there. Uh, the earthquake in Haiti was much substantially smaller than the one in Chile, in Concepcion, but had a much bigger toll because what happened with, with the tsunamis in, in Chile happens with the earthquakes in Haiti. That they happen every 80, 100 years, so people just forget and build whatever without considering this. It's not a matter of money, mainly. It's a matter of awareness. Um, and so the uh, earthquake, unfortunately, took Haitians very unprevented and caused a destruction that um, is really a shocking one. Uh, nevertheless, there's a distortion on this, and people tend to believe uh, in, the, um, in the rest of the world that the problems of Haiti derive from the earthquake, and that's not true. Haiti is, was and will continue to be a catastrophe before and after the earthquake, with or without earthquake. This is an aggravating thing, but they also have tornadoes, dictators, other things that, you know, continue to spoil the country one way or the other. Uh, not that we didn't have any dictators, but, uh, but uh, it's not only due to the, to the earthquake, but the, the destruction, uh, the destruction of this sort, uh, fortunately, we didn't see in Chile. Unfortunately, we saw in, in Port-au-Prince, basically. The center of the city continues to be like a bombard place on top of the destruction, and, and um, there's, there's been vandalization, and because of the informality that prevails, basically all the blocks in downtown Port-au-Prince are today uh, burned and empty, and everything happens in the streets. Uh, um, it's very problematic. It's even a bit dangerous. Uh, here's a nice cartoon that um, more or less um, builds an irony of what uh, Haitians can at best ex expect after the reconstruction. Um, I'll skip a bit of this. We uh, went there and tried to see what were the potentials. And we found some beautiful possibilities in the imagination of, of the population of how to use and reuse this uh, demolition material. We even found this wonderful market called uh, Marché Salomon that, according to my economist friends, proves that everything in the world has a monetary value because all this is all rusted uh, pieces of iron, bent nails, you name it, they have it there, so you can go uh, there. It also defeats a bit the purpose of our work because then it means that the demolition is no longer free. Hmm? It's not like given. It has a price already. But well, it's organized in this market that has the street of the steel, the street of the gypsum, the street of the toilets, the street. It's a very nice place, all in the streets. Wonderful country, Haiti. So we, um, what we did then is that we identified, with the help of Google Earth before even going, that the uh, houses look like this. And we mapped these little footprints of what was left. So our challenge is, because we had learned from Chanko that what we didn't have to do was to build a foundation, our challenge was to reuse the foundations. That was the principle of this new project, building on the previous. And this, I guess, is where I begin showing you something new, I hope, <laughs> compared to what we showed two years ago. So this is, you see, the, the, um, 
the, the situation of many houses around the country that are built. You know that uh, concrete blocks are not a very good building system in structural terms. To make it good, you need, uh, against earthquakes, you need, um, you need to frame them in reinforced concrete pillars and beams. And if you do so, it ceases to be cheap. Right? So it's no longer so cheap to build them with the proper reinforcements. So uh, what Haitians tend to do is to just build with uh, the blocks without the reinforcements. Um, we try to then develop a strategy out of this and propose a little project um, for one more or less hypothetical location of reusing these um, half or ruined houses and uh, that was awarded a prize uh, into something new. That was very ambitious. There's always a big leapfrog between your uh, competition design and your reality as we would eventually see. But this is the guiding image that uh, led us to work there. And this year, I'm just coming back last uh, Wednesday, we began to work on the development of this project in a more concrete and specific context, uh, trying to um, also cope with mistake number two that uh, we made in Chanco that was not working with the community. We went there as Europeans, not me, but well, everyone else, and worked with, uh, without, um, without the communities. We worked with the local administration, but that's not the same thing. In our project, remained a bit isolated. It didn't have much of an impact in Chanco. We could say that we learned, etc., and of course it was a great experience, but it didn't make any impact as we expected. We thought, well, we're bringing here, you know, uh, gunpowder and this is going to make a change. It didn't. Maybe we, maybe later, I don't know. But uh, in this case, we intended, in spite of these uh, technical drawings, we intended to work with the community. Here you can see how we tried to articulate a new wooden model module uh, on top of these uh, ruined places, trying to, uh, let's say, find the the uh, relevance and interest of these uh, uh, ruins. And we found a location where what we had been doing um, or imagining or um, uh, designing happened and brought it there uh, at the uh, edge of the city in this semi-rural area called Kualbuki. There's several villages where a number of houses were built a few years ago after this model with the support of an NGO by means of self-construction. So with this footprint, these little houses were built between 2006 and 2009. The NGO would come and give the materials and the families would build. Um, they were supposed to hire uh, someone who knew about building and to do that and to fulfill the requirement Unfortunately, the families would sell the materials to pay the workers. So the, the houses were, uh, didn't really have all the steel they needed and lost um, cement, etc., etc. So it ended up being a not very successful thing, which um, led to the destruction of many of these houses in the earthquake too, hmm? with less of a damage, less of a death toll, but nevertheless with the loss of this big effort uh, of families and, and uh, NGOs all together. So this is what the houses look still today. And this is what we took over as, as a challenge. Hmm? He, we're talking here about poor people that live with under a dollar a day. Hmm? And they have a very modest economy. The only advantage is that they live uh, at the edge of the countryside so they can get free spinach and they have water, which is a luxury in Haiti. I can tell you, I've been having showers with a cup for two months. Uh, a shower is a luxury in Haiti. Electricity is a luxury in Haiti. Um, well, among other things. Here's our work. There's the spinaches. Here's our work with the community in documented. We documented 136 houses of this kind, and we began the intervention in them by uh, characterizing the damages and beginning with the repairs. Hmm? What we could do then here is a bit far from what we had hoped to do in the design. So far we have built um, 
I think nine out of 30 houses by the end of the year, we should have completed the other 20 something. Uh, and to do so, we avoided the self-construction model. This is a completely collapsed house. And created a cooperative. Uh, this is kind of strange maybe for, for an architect, but we, we thought it would be very um, critical to have the um, skilled task force that could be actually able to uh, build the houses properly. So we went there and in these two months we worked in the training of a group of volunteers from the villages who see in this project work for free, like for zero, and see in this project a possibility of a work. And they work full time, they have literally, um, well, something close to nothing to eat and they work for free because we have managed to convince them that maybe this is a possibility for the future. We will intend to um, develop the project further next year and to the other 106 houses and maybe to other villages as well but so far we are working with 130. So here's our early stages of capacity building, thank you, uh, where we were working with the cooperative, with the um, uh, families, with the volunteers that are no longer students. Uh, we are developing this into a little bit of a foundation and uh, it's becoming an NGO in its own right. Hmm? Uh, the cultural gap is a big thing. We have learned to live with it, not to, not to cope with it, let's say. The enthusiasm is great and we are really happy and proud that the, uh, the uh, local cooperative members uh, have engaged. Here's the actual construction work in the same vein, except that we have less space for our uh, architectural speculation and uh, a bit more of an obligation with the uh, contingencies of each house. Here you see some of the repairs being made. We hope in the next 20, house, uh, 20 houses to be able to develop our ideas a bit further, but so far we have to uh, um, admit that our capacities have led us barely to um, uh, repair and reconstruct the houses. This little thing here in wood is already an achievement. In Haiti they build blocks there and they don't trust wood because it's supposed to be unsafe. After we build this, and this is very interesting, everyone now wants one of this timpani. That was our achievement. Very different, very, you know, light years away from the uh, imagination we had. Nevertheless, um, uh, an interesting experience. Here's another finding. We, we took over the systems, the construction systems in Chanco and built a wooden frame that's filled in with demolition debris. These are crushed blocks that are put there and filled in the way, uh, the way we did with the adobe in the previous case. Mm -hmm. uh, here you see the combination of volunteers and cooperative members and a bit of the result. This, this is the finishing that uh, makes the, the difference in Haiti, mm -hmm. the so-called crevisage. Here you see some other views of the same thing. So this is as much as we can do so far, hopefully next year I can show you something more sexy, but uh, um, it's, it's, it's already making a lot of sense to us because we are overcoming some of the shortcomings of the previous. We are working with a community that is seriously engaged. We have managed to convince them that it's somehow relevant and that uh, they can work with us. Uh, we also had time to party. There's a lot of music and happiness in Haiti, um, in spite of all. And uh, maybe to, to conclude and to wrap, uh, during these two months of, of stay, we had the occasion of receiving a very distinguished visitor, uh, a photographer called Tomas Munita, who is a very well-known, worldwide awarded photographer, press photographer, who works for the New York Times and Der Spiegel, etc. And I thought, ooh, the New York Times. That would be nice, huh? and uh, uh, it's in a way it was a bit disappointing the result. But eventually, I thought it was not so much. These are the pictures of Tomas Munita of our project. Maybe you will share the um, impression with me. It's 
the eye, the eye of the artist, I thought. Mm? He will tune in with architecture, but of course, not at all. He, he tuned in with the people. And what even first dis discouraged me, in the end, um, ended up being a compliment that somehow we managed to work with this uh, spirit and when this um, outsider came and looked at our project, he saw not the walls that we repaired and the houses that we intended to build and the systems that we had uh, recovered so carefully and successfully, but uh, with the life of the locals and, and the, the hope of these uh, communities that we hope to uh, support ourselves. Thank you very much. Well, many thanks to Elena Koch and uh, Renato D'Alanson. And I don't know if we have uh, time for, I, and we, we, we have no time. So many thanks to all of you and see you tomorrow.